in things like bone tissue and other archeolo archeological contexts. Paleoparasitology is specifically looking at parasites within those kinds of archeological and also paleontological contexts. And if we're looking specifically at human related stuff, then we're getting into archeoparasitology. So archeoparasitology is looking at these, again, human parasites from archeological contexts and I'll introduce you to these fellows that are right here. This is Dr. Carl Reinhardt, who was my PhD advisor as I was working at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He's seen here at the conference that I just mentioned to you, the Rocky Mountain Conference of Parasitologists, enjoying a delicious cupcake with a chocolate chick on top because that's appropriate for a parasite conference, right? Um, here's Dr. Reinhardt again, along with two of his colleagues, Dr. Um, Luis Fernando Fajeda, right here, and Dr. Adalto Arugio. And these three gentlemen wrote a book called The Foundations of Paleoparasitology, where they detailed a lot of the literature and a lot of the, the different techniques that are used in paleoparasitology for looking at both things that are archaeoparasitological in terms of working with humans and also um, in animal types of context and paleontological types of context. When we're talking about parasitology, we're primarily talking about the examination of things like human tissues. This can be mummified tissues, which we'll talk about a little bit more later in the presentation. This can be things like sections of mummified organs or hair or other parts of human tissues, um, such as bone can also be analyzed. Fecal materials are also used. So this can be things like coprolites, which are desiccated human feces, or like sediments from things like latrines. I've worked with cesspits and water closets and privies and all of these different kinds of places where people go poo. And then you can also work with what are called proxy materials. So things like clothing can give you information about parasitology, and we'll look at some of those examples later. Burial goods or other kinds of artifacts can give indications that people were dealing with parasites. You can also find references to parasites in different kinds of texts, as well as different types of artwork and other cultural items. So to put this in sort of a Halloween context for fun, we're gonna divide this talk into three different sections, looking at vampires and then zombies and then mummies. So for the vampires, we're talking about vampires. We're gonna be talking about parasites that are blood sucking types of parasites. We'll be talking about a couple of other parasites that feed on tissues or other parts of the life force. And we'll also be talking about a couple of different parasites that you can find just sort of hanging out in the bloodstream. For zombies, we're gonna be looking at a type of parasite that literally eats brain tissue, which will be interesting. We'll talk a little bit about some different parasites that manipulate the behaviors of their hosts and make them kind of mindless in a zombie-like state. And then for mummies, we'll talk about, you know, actual mummies and see what that's like. Let's start off with our vampires. With our obligate blood feeders, that means that these uh, types of parasites have to take a blood meal to be able to survive and or to be able to reproduce. Lice are the first organisms we're going to talk about 
And if you're a parasitologist, this is a pretty funny joke about them being nitpicky. And the reason is because part of the life cycle of a louse is in a little egg case that we call a knit. So when you go through and you're pulling the knits off of the hairs, that's known as nitpicking. And this is something that became kind of a colloquial phrase for being fastidious, right? Because you're picking all of these little knits out. And lice themselves are actually really, really nitpicky. They only like to spend their lives on specific host organisms. So the lice that you find on humans are very different from the lice that you find on goats and on gophers and on dogs and all of these other kinds of organisms. There are three types that you can find on humans. The first type is the head louse, Pediculus humanus capitis. And it's kind of fusiform in shape, kind of elongated, um, really cute little guy with these little antennae, just adorable. Who doesn't love lice, right? Am I, is it just me? Maybe it's just me. Body lice are the same species, Pediculus humanus, but they have a different subspecies because they're only found on the body as opposed to on the head. And there's a lot of genetic questions that are associated with that that we won't get into so much here. So Pediculus humanus humanus is known as the body louse. This is gonna be found everywhere but the head. And you can also often find these in association with textiles along the seams of clothing where you'll find their, the, them laying their knits and things like that. And then the last type of louse is the pubic louse. So this is Therus pubis. Unlike the nice fusiform shaped uh, Pediculus humanus, these guys are gonna be kind of fat and squatty and they're gonna be found in the pubic region. So they have a little bit different shape and morphology because they're dealing with different types of hair. And the body life specifically can be vectors for a couple of different types of disease, things like louse-borne typhus, relapsing fever, and also trench fever, just to name a few. In terms of archaeoparasitology, the nits are going to be things that we can find in textiles. So here you've got a picture of a little piece of denim, and you can see the little nits have been laid here. You can see some that are laid here along the seam. Um, and those are going to be places where sometimes you can find these in association with those textiles. You can also find them in the hair of mummies. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later when we talk about mummies. But here you can see all these little tiny dots are gonna be knits of lice that have been sitting there for thousands of years in this mummy that came from a site in South America. You can also find different artifacts associated with the behaviors of trying to deal with infestations of lice. So here is a, a louse comb. You can see that the tines are really close together and that the, this was something that was likely used to help people in ancient times to rid themselves of head lice. And you can also find references to these things in ancient and historical texts uh, of all different kinds. So some other types of uh, lice that you can find um, associated with mummies, we've been able to extract and take some really cool pictures of. So these are lice that are a couple thousand years old from some mummies in South America. Here you can see the knits uh, associated with the mummy hair right here. Uh, this is a louse where there was a little tiny baby louse emerging from a knit and it died about the time it was emerging. So we got a really cool snapshot in history. And then these are some of the adult lice uh, that were found in association with that same mummy. And then these black and white pictures are all scanning electron micrographs of some of these different lice. So you're able to see here the one that's emerging. Here you're able to see a hair shaft with some broken pieces of knit. Uh, there, there's an adult. And then this really cool honeycomb looking thing is the cap on the top of the knit. So if we look right here, there's a little cap. That's what that looks like up close and personal. And then again, here's the one that's emerging. And then this is one of the claws from one of these guys. So you can see what that looks like up close as well. Some of the other cool blood feeders are things like fleas. And these are much less picky, not nearly as nitpicky as our lice are when it comes to species, uh, species preference. So for hosts, they are gonna have some preference for certain types of hosts, but they'll maybe jump to other hosts opportunistically as they get the opportunity. The human flea is known as Pulex irritans, and here's a nice picture where we can see the male and the female, or wait, hold on, right, left, yeah, sorry, female, male. And then we've got uh, these types of organisms can be vectors for a lot of different diseases, specifically for things like the Black Plague and typhus. Most of you have probably heard about how fleas that were coming from rats were getting out and infesting humans and fighting them and causing uh, the perpetuation of this bacterial disease that we know as the bubonic plague. 
And they've actually been around even longer than humans. So this is a really cool picture of a flea that was found encapsulated in amber. So these things have been around um, even in prehistoric times, uh, feeding on whatever was around, I'm sure. With archaeoperistological studies, we believe that this is something that probably evolved in the New World. And we found evidence of this in a number of different Egyptian artifacts, as well as in the floor debris from different Roman sites and in settlements from Greenland that have Norse origins as well. And some of you may have heard of Otzi, the Iceman. This was about uh, a mummy that lived about 5,000 years ago. And there were two different fleas that were recovered from the body of that ice mummy. Some other obligate blood feeders are ticks, and these guys are not picky at all. These will feed on anything that they can get a hold of. There's a lot of different species of ticks. We're not gonna go into many of them, but here's a fun one known as the Lone Star Tick because it has a little white dot. I love that because I'm from Texas and it just makes me happy. These are gonna opportunistically feed on humans whenever they get a chance, and they can be vectors for a number of different kinds of diseases. So you can get things like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Many of you have probably heard of Lyme disease where you get that weird rash that has the characteristic bullseye uh, look to it. Tularemia or lichiosis. There are lots and lots of different things you can get from ticks. And there are other impacts on human health. So you can get something called tick paralysis, and this is kind of a scary thing where uh, a person has a tick attached to them. And because of some of the chemicals that are being released in the saliva of the ticks, um, a patient can become partially or fully paralyzed. Um, and it usually uh, is something that kind of becomes progressively more and more paralyzed. The good news is if you can find the tick and remove it, then eventually that para paralysis goes away. And it's like it never happened, uh, which is both cool and terrifying all at the same time. Another thing is that we're starting to see a rise in cases of a red meat allergy. And this is something that's associated with a molecule known as alpha-galactose. And this can be where um, some of these chemicals in the saliva of the ticks, again, can instigate this red meat allergy. Um, and this is something that tends to per persist in the person even after the tick has been removed. So we're seeing rising numbers of cases of that. In terms of archaeoparasitology, we found a lot of really cool things with ticks associated with art and texts, um, such as this picture right here that was um, a, a painting that had a picture of a jackal. And if you zoomed in on the ear, you can see that there are some little ticks that were drawn in, which means that these were organisms that were important enough and noticeable enough that it made their way into the artwork when they were trying to depict these animals. We can also find these on actual mummies. So when we think of mummies, we often think just of humans, but there were animal mummies too. So there was everything from cats and dogs to alligators um, to frogs and all kinds of other organisms that were mummified for different cultural reasons. Over here, you can see the ear of a mummified dog and you can see these little black dots are some of these ticks that were mummified alongside the dog uh, whenever the animal was preserved. <laughs> And there was one report of finding a tick inside of a human coprolite, which means that someone likely ate this tick. Uh, whether it was on accident or on purpose, of course we have no idea, but there is speculation that it may have been done for controlling parasites uh, because there are some different primates who are known to uh, pick different ectoparasites off of each other and then eat them to control the parasite numbers rather than throwing them on the ground and letting them reinfect infest somebody else. So this right here is a tick that's made its way through the digestive tract that came out in the coprolite and that survived um, a couple thousand years before being found by a researcher. And it looks in, like it's in pretty good shape for all that it's been through. Some other cool blood feeders when we're talking about parasites are leeches. Most of you probably have had some sort of uh, understanding of what a leech is. Hopefully not some firsthand experience, but it kind of makes you cooler in parasite circles if you have had firsthand experience. So just you're in good company if you have. Um, most of these guys are gonna be freshwater species. There are some leeches that are found in marine environments and also found in terrestrial types of environments. And not all leech leeches suck blood. Many of them just feed on uh, plant juices and other things like that. One that does feed on blood is the medical leech or Haruto medicinalis. And here's a nice picture of it. Look at this gorgeous organism. It's got these beautiful coloration patterns. It just has all this, these curves going on. That is a beautiful leech. That is a nice looking leech. Um, these guys are gonna secrete a ton of different kinds of uh, chemicals in their saliva that help to 
uh, produce these anticoagulants so that the parasite can continue to feed on blood as it is attached onto its host. And there are lots of references in both ancient and historic texts to both the uh, infestation of people getting leeches from wading around in some of these water aquatic environments, and also the purposeful usage of these types of leeches for medicinal purposes. Um, there's references to leeches in the Bible, which is pretty cool. And they've also been used for a process known as bloodletting for about 2,500 years. And here's our fun little medicinal leech um, engorging itself on the arm of a willing volunteer, which is very nice of that person. Um, and these things have been reported from texts in ancient India and Greece and Rome and probably lots of other places as well. It was something, the practice of bloodletting was something that was used all the way up through the 1800s. And in the year 1863 alone, it was used so frequently in British hospitals that the people who were collecting local leeches and bringing them in for the hospitals to use couldn't keep up with the demand. Um, and it really did a number on the populations in that region of the world. So they started importing leeches. And in that year, 7 million leeches were imported for, the, for medicinal purposes just in hospitals um, in the British Isles. And these guys kind of fell out of fashion as bloodletting fell out of fashion because we found better technologies for being able to deal with things and better, uh, gained better understanding of how the human body works. But they kind of made a comeback in the 1980s and started uh, being used for helping to restore circulation after people had undergone different microsurgeries because they could help to um, get that blood flowing again after kind of reconnecting some of these smaller blood vessels. And they're still used today for some things intermittently. They're not hugely popular, but, uh, but they do still have a little bit of a place in medicine. Okay, so moving out of blood and into tissues. These are some of the other things that, um, that these things can feed on. Mites are very uh, variously picky. Some of them are very host specific. Some of them will just chew or munch on whatever's around. And there are a lot of different kinds of mites. And they're very understudied. So this is a really cool area to go into in terms of research. Um, one of my favorites is known as a follicle mite. And this, these are mites that belong to the genus, genus Demodex. And they look super cool in this like action image right here. But what you've got is a hair follicle. And then these guys are these little mites. And these are things that are often found in association with our eyebrows. They kind of just hang out. They eat um, mostly dead skin cells and like oil and that kind of stuff. Uh, but they're really cute because they're like fusiform shaped and I don't know, they're adorable. Ever, anybody else find these adorable? Is that, is that just me again? It could just be me. Um, another type of mite that we uh, sometimes associate with uh, tissue eating are the scabies mites or the sarcoptes mites. And these guys actually burrow into the skin and cause these nasty little rashes. And um, if you mess with the rashes enough, you can actually pop the little mites out, uh, which is both cool and disgusting. And it kind of just depends on if you're a parasitologist, if that's your jam or not. Uh, these are things that have been present in Egypt as early as 494 BC. Um, Aristotle also talked about these in some of his writings, calling them lice that escaped from little pimples if pricked, um, which sounds kind of nice in a weird way. Uh, not that I want to get scabies, I'm just saying. If I did, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. There are worse parasites. Um, there are also descriptions of these for things from the ancient texts of the Romans. And that was all I was going to say about scabies. I felt like there was something else, but you've probably heard about scabies. It's something that has been in association with humans for a long time. Chiggers is another type of things associated with mites, and this isn't a specific species. Um, but a lot of different larval mites can kind of go in and cause irritation to the skin in uh, what we call chiggers. Scrub typhus is a type of disease that you can get from one type of these uh, little chiggers that get in and get all infesty. So now let's talk about a couple of things that live in the bloodstream. The first one is one of my favorite parasites known as plasmodium. And this is the parasite that causes malaria. Here we can see this parasite hanging out as the little yellow dots inside this red thing. This red thing is a red blood cell. 
So that's kind of giving you an idea of the scale. So these are very, very tiny. These are little single celled organisms that hang out inside of these red blood cells. And um, they are sort of masters of disguise. So normally when you've got a red blood cell that's got a defect in it or has like a pathogen or something, it goes through your spleen and your spleen's like, hey, something's wrong with you. Let's get you out of here. Let's, let's filter this bad boy out. But plasmodium actually goes in and is able to sort of prop up the cellular structure of the red blood cell. So it's hard for the spleen to detect that there's something wrong with this blood cell. So plasmodium inside the red blood cell sort of drives in, says, hey, spleen, what's going on? The spleen's like, something going on? And it's like, no, I'm just, just normal red blood cell, totally fine, nothing going on. And the spleen's like, nah, this checks out, go ahead, go back into the bloodstream. And then the parasite multiplies, reproduces, and we start to continue to get pathology associated with malaria. And there have been some really cool uh, ancient DNA studies that have come out of looking for malaria in um, archeological materials, primarily from bone samples. So we've had a number of different studies come out looking at um, different historical figures whose bones have been um, excavated and looking at whether or not those people had malaria. Another type of parasite that lives in the bloodstream are known as trypanosomes. And here's a really cool picture of one right here. Again, these are little red blood cells to give you some scale. And these little white dots are our white blood cells, which you probably all knew because you were a smart audience. So this is what we've got hanging out inside the bloodstream. And there are lots of different kinds of trypanosomes. We're gonna talk about one a little bit more later in the presentation, but two that I wanna draw your attention to are of the genus Leishmania and trypanosoma. And here are some really cool archeological finds. So with Leishmania, this is one that even though it lives in the bloodstream, it can manifest in destroying some of the bone tissues, especially of the face. So this mummy that was excavated, the um, structure of the face had been destroyed in this area to, due to a cutaneous type of leishmaniasis that's associated with this type of parasite. This other thing that you're going, what is all this weird gray, what's happening? What you're looking at right here is a human pelvis and all of this is poop that has accumulated in great mass inside of this human pelvis. And this person had something called megacolon where the, the colon became so enlarged due to parasitism and filled with feces that it just filled up that pelvic cavity and probably contributed to the death of this individual. So this was something associated with a disease known as trypanosoma cruzi that causes what we call Chagas disease. And then lots of different mummy studies have looked at some of these different parasites as well. And then the last thing that lives in the blood I wanted to draw to your attention is schistosoma. And these are little worms. These guys hang out in the bloodstream. The male and the female uh, find themselves or find each other in the bloodstream. And then the female has a specialized canal called the gynecophoric canal. And the male um, makes his way into her canal. And then they just spend the rest of their lives together in this state of what we call living in copula. Um, so they mate for life and they just make babies and live out the, the end of their days in the bloodstream. Isn't that romantic? So sweet. Um, and also schistosomes are really important for mummy studies because the first parasite egg that was ever recovered from a mummy was a type of schistosome egg. And we'll kind of circle back to that a little bit later. Okay, so let's make our way into zombies because zombies are super cool. I'm really into zombies. So the legends of the zombie are things that have pretty elusive origins. We don't really know for sure where they started, but we think they probably started on the African continent and then made their way over to Haiti. And we have some of the first documented stories dating back to some of these early Haitian zombies. And there were themes like the undead theme, and you got a lot of these like loss of autonomy things that came from the voodoo culture that was associated uh, with those people. And the question is, where did people come up with this idea? Where, where do we come up with these ideas of things that lose their autonomy and just sort of lumber around and wanna eat brains and do all of these things? 
Well, there's some speculation that maybe it's associated with our old friend, Trypanosoma. So this is a disease that um, there are a number of different species in Africa that cause uh, this disease known as African sleeping sickness. People who are infected with this disease as the disease progresses without being treated, they're going to see a disruption in their sleep cycle, which is where we get the name African sleeping sickness. They're gonna cause a lot of neurological symptoms. So you get confusion, you get a patient who oftentimes becomes uh, much more aggressive than they ever were, other personality changes. You're gonna see tremors and you're gonna see some paralysis, in some cases, partial paralysis of things like the face that can result in drooling, which maybe is giving you some imagery of zombies right now. You're also gonna see some disturbances in speech and also in the gait or the walking patterns that people have. So they tend to lumber a little bit more which again, may be something that contributes to our idea of the zombies. So you can imagine if people were being infected with this disease and started to see these manifestations that maybe they wouldn't understand where this was coming from and the legends of the zombies could have been born out of this. And just a, a little side note about this because it's Halloween and it seems appropriate. Um, these guys are gonna have a really cool adaptation for being able to evade the host immune system. So they can trick the host immune system into not destroying them. And the way this works is they are coated in uh, what are called glycoproteins. So think like sugary protein type things on the surface of the uh, parasites. And the trypanosomes have the unique ability to actually change those surface coatings so that they can evade the host immune system. So here in this diagram, we've got some little trypanosomes that are green. Think of that green as the outer surface coating. The immune system comes in and goes, hey, there's something up with you. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna mount an immunological response. I'm gonna send in some antibodies to destroy all the green things, right? And while that's happening, some of these parasites are gonna change that outer surface coating to not be, uh, in this example, green anymore. So now we've got one guy hanging out here who's blue. And here comes our antibodies. They attack all the green, pew, 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 everybody dies. But because they couldn't recognize the surface coating on the blue parasite, that blue parasite's gonna survive the onslaught and then it's gonna reproduce like mad. And now we have a whole new infection and the immune system is gonna have to mount an entirely new immunological response. And this is gonna be a cycle that repeats itself, which is why trypanosomes are so difficult to treat because they're gonna be able to um, have this adaptation of evading the host immune system over and over and over. Okay, and now the brain eating types of parasites, really just one that we're gonna talk about. And this is a parasite that's an amoeba known as Neglaria phalari. This is a parasite that normally is not a parasite. It oftentimes just hangs out in the sediments, uh, in lakes and other kinds of water systems, uh, totally not pathogenic, but when the conditions are right, then it's going to uh, wait for things to kind of get warmer and it's gonna migrate up into the water column. It's gonna change its entire body shape and then it becomes infective to humans. So you can find it in fresh water. You can find it in industrial discharge, geothermal vents, any of these areas that can really make the water warm, uh, makes it really inviting for turning the parasite into that pathogenic state. It's gonna cause a disease known as primary amoebic meningitis. And this is when the parasite, um, if you swallow some water with this parasite, it goes into the stomach, acid takes it out, no big deal. If the parasite, however, gets up your nose, so you accidentally inhale a little bit of water, then it's gonna go through the uh, olfactory nerve, straight to your brain, through the cribriform plate, through the brain, uh, blood brain barrier, and that's when you're gonna see the infection. It gets in there and it's like, ooh, brain tissue, nom, nom, nom. And then it's gonna to start to reproduce. And then all of its buddies are like, hey, party time. And we're gonna just make your brain into Swiss cheese. It's really terrifying. But the good news is it's super rare. Um, this is something that in the first stage, you're gonna get headaches, fever, nausea, vomiting. So some pretty nondescript symptoms in the early stages. And then in the second stage, you'll start to see things like stiff neck, altered mental status, um, sometimes seizures, and in extreme cases, coma. And these are things that um, can progress very quickly to the point where it's uh, difficult to diagnose, it's difficult to treat, um, and it's so rare that most people wouldn't think that there was anything like this that could be happening. So of the 148 cases that have occurred in the United States since 1962, only five people have survived. And worldwide, this thing has a mortality rate of like 98% or something. Um, we have developed ways of treating it, but those, those types of treatment really depend on early detection 
and early diagnosis. And many times this is just a really difficult thing to catch. So other things related to zombies are that loss of autonomy where we've got manipulation of host behavior. So there are lots of different species that engage in these different practices for being able to change the behavior of their hosts. And I've got a bunch of different examples here. I'm just gonna kind of quickly tell you a few of these uh, just to whet your appetite. You can go look this up on your own later and be super amazed for hours on end. So let's kind of start here at the top. This is a neat little spider down in the um, tropical areas of South America. It's a spider that normally leaves a like pretty little spider web. But when it gets uh, infected with a para the larvae of a parasitic wasp, comes in and just injects them right into the body cavity of the spider, the parasites need a place to be able to pupate. They need a little cocoon. And instead of weaving their own cocoon, they just take their spider host, they manipulate the behavior, and infected spiders will actually weave a little cocoon instead of their normal spider web, and then go in and uh, serve as a nutrient resource by dying and letting the parasites eat them inside of this cocoon. You have things like snails right here. And normally a snail would just have two little eye stalks, but you can see here that it's got these little stripy things coming out of its eye stalks. This is a type of parasite that when it infects the snail, it migrates into the eye stalks and it starts to pulsate. And there are really cool videos of this online. And the reason it does this is because the parasite has a bird as its next host in its life cycle, but it doesn't know how to get to the bird. And the type of bird that is its host doesn't normally eat snails. So what it's doing is mimicking types of caterpillars by pulsating in the eye stalks of this little snail. And then a bird goes, oh, hey, what's going on with that? It also um, changes the behavior of the snail host. Normally they hang out in the dark where they can't be seen very well. And infected snails will actually climb up on leaves and things and come out in the light, uh, making them more exposed to things like bird predators that the parasite needs for its life, continuing its life cycle. Sometimes the snail dies because the bird eats its head. Sometimes the snail um, lives because the bird just kind of picks off an eye stalk and the snail can regrow it. So it's kind of a toss up on whether or not this is really bad for the snail or just a slight inconvenience. Something similar happens with ants in this picture. So we've got um, a normal ant right here. It's just hanging out. It gets infected with a type of uh, little worm known as a nematode. So there's this little nematode parasite that gets into the ant. Now the nematode needs to get into a bird as well, but this bird doesn't eat ants, it only eats fruit. So what it does is actually changes the behavior of the ant to carry its butt really high like this. Butt's a technical term, surely the abdomen. Uh, and it actually changes the color of the abdomen to this red color. So this is an example of fruit mimicry where the ant looks like a berry. And so the bird eats the ant thinking it's a berry and instead, Yay, you're infected with a parasite, congratulations. And uh, so that's kind of another neat uh, host manipulation behavior. With uh, kind of continuing on with the, the conversation about ants, these are two different ants that get infected by two different types of fungi. And those types of fungi um, need to be able to perpetuate in the life cycle uh, by infecting other ants. But normally ants, when they are infected with something and the colony members know it, they will pick up that ant and throw it in the trash pile. Like, get it out of the colony. We don't want it to, to mess with stuff. What this will do is it'll say, hey, you know, you should like leave the colony and go up on this blade of grass and bite down real hard and die. And the ant's like, oh, sounds good. And so it does this. And usually the blade of grass or the stick or whatever it clamps down onto is something that's overhanging the colony. And so when the fungal um, fruiting body is able to make its way out of the ant, it'll drop the spores directly back onto the colony and reinfect. And we can see the process of that life cycle perpetuating itself. We can also see things like uh, little worms, like this little orange thing right here is a type of pentastone worm and it's inside of this little amphipod. And again, kind of like our snail friends, the amphipods don't like to be in the light. They like to hang out where it's nice and dark and safe. But when they're infected with this pentastone, they are more likely to go into the light and get eaten by the next host in the life cycle of the parasite. Um, another sort of wasp thing happening down here with a cockroach. You've got this little ampulix, a parasitic wasp, that's gonna wrestle the cockroach and it's gonna inject its eggs into the cockroach and then the cockroach is kind of kind of meander around doing whatever the parasite needs it to do. 
And then once the parasite eggs have hatched, it'll eat the cockroach from the inside out and then burst out of the cockroach in uh, a true zombie movie fashion, which is really cool. And then the last guy on here, this is a little grasshopper, or a Katie did. And um, she has been infected with what's called a nematomorph type of worm, which is the little curly spring looking thing that's coming out of its butt here again, technical term. And with this nematomorph, this is a thing that likes to reproduce in fast moving streams. But this type of insect doesn't really like water. So what happens is when it's infected with this parasite and the parasite is ready to reproduce, it's going to change the behavior of the, of the insect host. And instead of avoiding water, the insect host will hop right into water and the, it'll die because it'll drown because it's not meant to be there. And then these little nematomorphs will emerge from the anus and go on to like find other nematomorphs that have done the same. And again, it's a beautiful love story between these nematomorphs getting together in these fast moving streams. Now this is a parasite that changes host behavior that deserved its own slide because it is the coolest. This is one of my favorite parasites of all time. Toxoplasma gondii is this little parasite that normally cycles between cats and rodents. And that's just sort of the back and forth and back and forth. But what's cool about it is that it actually changes the behavior of the rodents when it's infecting them. So normally rodents have this innate fear response to the smell of cat urine. They know that's dangerous. I need to stay away from that. I'm just not gonna go anywhere near it. But when they're infected with Toxoplasma gondii, the parasites migrate into the brain of the rat. They get into the amygdala where the innate fear responses are controlled and it actually changes the behavior so that infected mice develop an affinity and actually go towards cat urine. So they're not just actively avoiding it, they're actively seeking it out and it makes them more likely to get eaten, more likely to be able to perpetuate the life cycle of this parasite. Now this is something that can and does get into humans. In fact, 23% of the human population in the United States is infected or at least seropositive, meaning that at some point they were infected with Toxoplasma gondii. This is the reason that pre pregnant women should not change litter boxes. Um, normally, if you're an immunocompetent individual, it's not something that's gonna cause a problem, but if you're immunocompromised or say pregnant, it can be really problematic and it can cause some pretty severe and nasty birth defects. So this is a, um, a, a disease that we really try to, to avoid getting pregnant women to have. Um, let's see, there are some really cool seropositive correlations between changes in human behavior and infection with this parasite. So um, there's some changes that have been noted for people who have at some point in their life been positive for the parasite, um, tend to have reduced reaction times, and they, um, we see a higher incidence of this parasite in people who have dopamine related types of disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder or schizophrenia. But again, these are all correlative studies. So there's no causal link that's ever been established between these things. And this parasite has really elusive origins. So um, we know that it's likely something that's found in the new world, um, but we don't know for sure exactly when or how it evolved. Um, some of the different studies that have been done, some people have done some DNA studies looking at toxoplasma, trying to understand where it originated um, and how it's been associated with humans in the past. And then there's been some studies of the things called quids, and that's what this weird looking pile of stuff is right here. Quids are fibrous materials that people would chew up and then spit out and they desiccate the same way that coprolites do, so you can find them in some archaeological areas. And for my dissertation, I looked at some of these different quids uh, to see if we could find toxoplasma. Didn't find them, but I was also developing a new method. So I don't know if the method didn't work or if the people didn't have them, um, which is uh, what happens when you work with archeological stuff. Um, but I did get a paper out of it, out of negative results, which was kind of a point of pride. So that was really exciting. Okay, so now let's move on to mummies. So this is the last part of the presentation. We're talking about actual mummies now. The first archeological evidence, like I mentioned earlier, of parasites from mummies came from a mummy um, that was reported in 1910, and it was a type of schistosome egg. So this is that schistosome egg. Remember the people that live, the uh, people, sorry. I forget because I have a connection with parasites. Um, these were the parasites that lived in copula where the male lived inside the female. So they produced these eggs that look kind of like this and it was a calcified schistosome egg that was found in a mummy that was sort of the first archaeoparasitological study ever published. 
There have been a lot of archaeoparasitological studies published on mummies since then. And this is a picture of some of my colleagues, um, a team led by Dr. Dong Hoon Shin in South Korea. And they've looked at lots of different cool Korean mummies from a lot of different time periods and found all kinds of nifty parasites. What's really cool about working with mummies as opposed to working with things like latrine sediments or coprolites is that you have individual data that you can connect to an individual person. So you know that this person was infected with this parasite and you know a little bit about when and where that person lived. This is also something that we can compile these individual data sets to be able to look at populational data and have a, a little more robust set of data than when we're looking at coprolites. And we don't know if we're looking at 12 coprolites, is this one person, is it two people, is it three people, is it someone who just had a really bad day? Like how many people are represented by all of these, these different things? So mummy studies are unique in that you can really get some definitive information about that. It can also lead into this area of archaeoepidemiology, where we're looking at these patterns of disease in the past by looking at uh, pulling all of this data together. And when we think of mummies, we often just think of like the, the classic Halloween thing where they're wrapped up in bandages and all of that. But there are a lot of different kinds of mummies. They are prepared in a lot of different ways. So you certainly have the classic Egyptian mummies that are covered in resin and wrapped in these bandages. But you also have mummies that are stuffed with like wheat and other kinds of vegetal material. Um, you have some mummies that uh, mercury and other types of embalming techniques are used. You have some that are just sort of buried in the desert and the, the sand helps to preserve the mummies. You have some uh, where they're buried in ice and then the ice preserves the mummies or they're thrown into a bog, like a peat bog, and that preserves the bodies. So a mummy is just defined as, as any sort of human remains that still has some sort of tissue, some sort of soft tissue preservation. And these come from a wide variety of time periods. Again, we often think of like the classic Egyptian mummy, but we've got mummies down in South America that predate the Egyptian mummies by about 7,000 years. And we also have mummies that were created as recently as the 1920s. So this is not something that is restricted to a specific time period. And again, we often think of just adult mummies and like things like that, but there are also children mummies. So there are a number of different kinds of things you'll find in that way. And then I just wanted to throw out for you some really cool mummy pictures. This is one that's a bog body. So this was pulled out of a peat bog. And the cool thing about bog mummies is that it really preserves the skin well. So you can see that um, we've got um, wrinkles in the skin. Sometimes you can find tattoos on these kinds of mummies that are really well preserved. Um, and it just has to do with the environment in which these are preserved. So this is an Iron Age mummy uh, that you can still see the wrinkles on his forehead. This is an example of an ice mummy or something that was preserved in a really cold environment. This is a mummy from China that had a very elaborate type of um, embalming process used. And um, I think they're still working on trying to tease out exactly how this was done. And you can see that this one was also really well preserved. This is a mummy that was hanging out in the Atacama Desert. So this is one that was preserved by the um, desert type conditions. And then this is a child mummy that was preserved in the 1920s. Um, her name was Rosalia Lombardo, and she was two years old when she passed away. Her body is now on display in the Capuchin catacombs in Palermo in Sicily. And it's one of the best examples of preservation that you can see. They call her the Sleeping Beauty of Sicily because she just looks like a sleeping baby. So this is an incredibly well-preserved type of mummy. Most of the ectoparasite studies when we're looking at mummies are focusing on lice because that's what preserves really well. And lice tend to sort of go down with the ship whenever somebody dies, whereas something like a flea or a tick, you're less likely to find them because they often hop off the host after the host gets cold. So again, we've got these really cool knits, some of them where you've got little lice emerging from the knits. Here we've got another cool adult. And this is a really elaborate hair, um, hair braiding pattern that's found on a male in one of these mummies from South America. And you can see all of these little lice associated with them. And this was a really neat study because they first just sort of reported like, hey, we found lice in these mummies from South America. And then as they collected more and more data from these mummies, they were able to start looking at the paleoepidemiology and start looking at the patterns of distribution. And what they found was that the males who had these really elaborate weaving patterns in their hair 
um, tended to have more lice, whereas the females and also the children who were in those same populations had fewer lice than their male counterparts. And they think this may have been associated with the behavior of nitpicking where they were actually grooming each other as part of their um, things that they did for social activities. When we look at the endoparasites of mummies, these are focused mostly on what we call helminths, which are these worms. And the worms themselves don't typically preserve in these types of specimens, but the eggs from the worms do preserve, and that's what we can often find. This is my colleague, Dr. Dario Piambino Mascali, and I met him my first semester of working on my PhD, and we've been working together ever since. Um, my very first scientific paper was actually um, a study looking at some mummies from Lithuania. These were historic mummies. And here's some of the lower extremities from one of the mummies. Here's the sample that Dario sent us, and we were able to find some parasites from that mummy. So these were um, 18th and 19th century mummies, and we were able to find Trichuris trichuria, which causes trichuriasis, um, and that is a type of whipworm. And then we were also able to find Ascaris lumbricoides, which causes um, ascariasis. And this is what the Ascaris worm looked like after um, a couple of centuries. And then these are what our little whipworms looked like. Now, if you knew what a whipworm looked like, which I didn't show you beforehand, I'll show you what a real one looks like in the next, or a better one looks like in the next slide, but they're kind of lemon shaped normally. And what we were finding with this mummy is that they had these odd shapes where they were folded or malformed and we didn't really know what was going on at first. But then we realized that there was probably a female worm that had these eggs inside of her. And whenever she um, decomposed, the eggs persisted even though they weren't fully formed yet because these worms uh, fully form in the feces. Whenever they're deposited outside of the body, they kind of go through a process um, an embryological process in the soil. So these were not fully formed parasites. And what this indicated to us is that we had to really be on top of our game when we're working with uh, mummy intestines because many times the worms are not fully embryologically developed yet. And we still need to be able to recognize them as being members of specific species. So we, um, this first paper that Dario and I published together was about that taphonomic issue that is unique to working with mummies. You don't see it with coprolites or latrine sediments because you're working with eggs that are fully formed. You only really see this when you um, happen to run across it in mummy tissues. And another cool study I did was looking at a mummy from Belgium. This was with uh, an association with Dr. Elizabeth Rocks, who is another professor that teaches at the School of Mines in the biology department. She's our resident epidemiologist. And we worked on uh, this medieval woman. This was a, what we call a skin and bones mummy. So she was mostly skeletonized, but she did have some soft tissues. And she also had a bunch of poop that had just sort of compacted inside of her body. And as she decomposed and the intestines on the outside of that poop decomposed, then the, the poop was preserved in context with her body. And we were able to use the materials from those enterolites um, or that preserved poop to be able to look for these parasites. And this woman was just chalky jam full of parasite eggs, had so many. She had over a million whipworm eggs inside of her. And this is what this whipworm egg normally looks like, a, lot, a little more lemon shaped, a little more uh, easily diagnosable than what we saw in the mummies from Lithuania. And this was indicative about 53 to 30, 315 female worms uh, that were found inside of the body of this person before the female worms themselves decomposed. And we were also able to find uh, through doing dietary analysis that this woman had eaten a lot of chaff from wheat. And that's kind of a weird thing to eat because it's very fibrous, but it was a treatment in medieval times for dealing with worms. So we think that it was something that was prescribed by her physician. And there was so much chaff and so many worms that we um, talked about in, a, in the paper that we wrote together that she likely had some compromised ability of her intestines to do their normal job just from all of the excess material and also because the parasites um, burrow into the intestinal lining. So probably compromise the intestine's ability to do their job. And we don't know if this is something that contributed to the death of this individual, but it could have been something that contributed to her, her death through um, constipation. So we kind of talked about that a little bit in our paper. And then some other neat stuff that I've done with mummies. I was able to, very, very fortunate to be able to host a mummy studies field school along with my colleague Dario and my PhD advisor, um, Dr. Reinhardt, as well as his wife, um, uh, Dr. Deb Meyer. 
And together we hosted this Mummy Studies Field School where we took students from Nebraska all the way to Sicily. Some of them, this was their first time even leaving the state of Nebraska, much less the country. So it was a really great teaching experience and getting to see these students um, kind of getting out and getting exposed to the culture, but also learning a lot about mummy studies. And this was our first class right here. And we were hanging out um, in a place called Piraño where there were some really neat mummies that we got to show the students. The school itself was held in a place called Santa Lucia del Mela, which is a little uh, village in Sicily. And we stayed in a building that used to be a convent that's now been converted for other purposes. And underneath the convent was a crypt with mummies. So we were eating and sleeping and living and learning all in this convent above this crypt where the mummies that we were studying uh, resided. And so we'd you know, eat our breakfast and then go down into the crypt and check out the mummies. And it was just a really cool experience. Uh, we took the students on a couple of different trips outside of the crypts that they were working on in Santa Lucia to Peraño, which is again where we we're taking this group picture. Um, here is me and a couple of our students going down into a crypt in Paraño that had a number of um, priests that were preserved. And it was a very special crypt that most visitors aren't able to visit. So it was neat, a neat experience for the students. We also took them to Savoca, which does have some publicly open crypts for you to go and see mummies on display. And then we took them to Palermo, which is where we got to see these guys, which are the Capuchin catacombs. Um, and there are a couple thousand mummies in that area that are on display for the public, but we were able to do a little bit of visual analysis and, uh, and really see some of this stuff hands-on with students. So being able to visit some of these larger crypts, uh, larger catacombs, as well as some smaller uh, crypts and a little bit larger crypts was a really neat experience. Some of the other insights you can get from doing this kind of work is to expand into these other areas of study. So archaeovirology is a really cool area of study where you're studying viruses from archaeological context. And that can tell you everything from stuff about disease to about migrational patterns. You can actually look at the viruses from a mummy and determine where that mummy grew up, not just where they were when they died, which is really cool. And this is uh, Marie Topinen. She is one of my colleagues who worked with me at the Mummy Studies Field School. And she's getting ready to defend her dissertation very soon. So. Uh, pretty soon she will be Dr. Marie, and we're excited about that. Um, I've done some work with paleoserology. I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but uh, for part of my dissertation, I worked with uh, immunodiagnostics. So we were looking at some of these immunological markers for different diseases, uh, different parasites in the past, looking at uh, primarily coprolites, but also working a little bit with those quids that we talked about. And then you can also look at ancient DNA. And this is a really cool area of studies that my colleague Amanda Rollins here has been working in. Um, and she's looked at parasite DNA uh, to be able to determine again, these parasitic diseases that otherwise you don't have any evidence of. That's very cool. And then I've also dabbled in something called archaeoentomology, which is looking at insects from archaeological context. And there are some really neat things that you can learn from that. So this was uh, a mummy in uh, Italy that the curators had found some insect damage on. He had some holes in his hands. They found some cuparia in the back of this mummy. And the curators wanted to know whether or not these were flies or beetles that were coming in and destroying the mummy in a curatorial concern, or if they were things that just infected or infested the mummy earlier um, in the decompositional process. So they sent us some samples of these uh, little cuparia prior to this mummy becoming beatified. And then the mummy became beatified while we had the, the samples in our lab. So we all of a sudden had holy relics in our lab, which was kind of cool. Um, and uh, we were able to determine that those were fly puparia from flies that likely infested the body early in the decompositional process, not something of curatorial concern. And so the curators were really happy with that, which was cool. And so to kind of just summarize everything, archaeoparasitology provides a lot of really cool information about the archaeological, historical, and biogeographical um, information that is out there. So it can really help us to answer some of those big questions, both in the field of biology and in the field of archaeology and anthropology. It can give us information about what people have been eating and what people, what has been eating other people. So if we know we're seeing fish parasites, we know this person ate a fish, um, those kinds of things can be um, other types of information that we get other than just what parasite is this. 
We can also get an idea of ethnomedicine, and we often pair things like archaeological study, archaeoparistological studies, excuse me, um, with things like palynological studies, which is pulling out things like pollen grains, so we can get a feel for was this person eating something medicinal um, or looking at other types of dietary residues or remains to see what, uh, what kinds of things may have been going on there. This can also give us information about hygiene practices and sanitation procedures from these different populations. We can learn about farming practices. We can learn about animal domestication. For my dissertation, I looked at coprolites from um, this cave in Mexico that were about 3,000 years old. And we started finding a lot of, well, actually, when I first started, my PhD advisor was like, oh, you should do this site because they're all human coprolites and you won't have any, like, any issues of thinking about whether they're dog or human coprolites. And then we started finding dog parasites. We were like, oh, well, now we have to rethink this because uh, these are clearly not human coprolites anymore. And we started finding other dietary residues that gave us an indication that some of these coprolites were dog and not human in origin. So we were able to um, go through and analyze these coprolites and start looking at the relationship between humans and dogs and how they were sharing parasites. What kind of parasites were humans giving to dogs? What kind of parasites were dogs giving to humans? And what kind of parasites were they not necessarily sharing but, but finding in the same sort of archeological context? So that gave us some indications about those relationships. It is also something that can um, elucidate migrational patterns. Uh, Dr. Rox that I mentioned earlier, who works at School of Mines has been working on some samples from a cave in Oregon where they've been looking at some of these um, hookworms that could not have gotten there um, and the time period that they were there based on the climate. So they were talking about microclimates inside of clothing and all kinds of cool stuff. So she's been working on some stuff looking at that. And it also gives us a little bit of an indication about whether people were going across the Bering land bridge or whether people were taking a coastal route or uh, an oceanic route to be able to get into the new world. So there's some cool stories that you can get from some of that information. And some of that also gives you some insights into things like climate change. And then of course, epidemiology through time is uh, just a really fascinating area to be able to go into as well. And then this is not a totally relevant picture, but I wanted to put it up here because it was cool. This is some rock art from a cave in Minas Gerais in Brazil uh, when I was there for my first archeological dig. And with that, I will take whatever questions you have. Yes. So my wife happens to be a nurse and has applied to be digital tables before. So I'm curious, are there any other examples that you found where parasites were intentionally applied or encouraged, or is it just kind of a example? That's a great question. And there are other examples. So uh, there's this theory known as the lost friends theory, which I just think is super adorable. It's an extension of the hygiene hypothesis. So the idea is that we have evolved, co-evolved alongside parasites for so long that as we start kind of getting rid of them in the modern era, we start to develop autoimmune diseases because our immune systems are like, oh, what are we supposed to do now? And so things like um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease have been, um, are these autoimmune diseases that are really terrible, that cost a lot of money, sometimes a lot of surgeries to be able to um, deal with, lots of medication, very expensive for patients. But there have been some studies that have shown that introducing things like whipworms or hookworms at a controllable level in a patient um, can actually be an effective thing that gives your immune system something to fight. And then people will go into, I think with ulcerative colitis, it's like 80% remission rates. Um, which is really fascinating, but it's not a procedure that's approved by the FDA. There's, you know, lots of different, you know, kind of trial things going on with it. Um, but it is really fascinating. And with things like whipworms and hookworms, these are not parasites that auto infect. So they're not going to be like producing more and more babies inside of a single patient. They're just going to be producing eggs that are going to come out in that patient's feces. So you just want to make sure that they're not pooping in a place where they're going to contaminate other people. Um, but with something like a hookworm, you know, you get like a little vial, you put it on your arm, they burrow into your skin, it's a little itchy for a little while, and then for three to seven years, you don't have to do anything else. You just sort of wait it out um, until the parasites kind of die off and then you have to re-inoculate. With whipworms, I can't remember how many years, I think it's a little bit shorter lifespan, if I'm correct, but that's just something like you, you drink a little vial or you put it in some Coke or something and then, you know, there you go. 
So there are some other issues with that. There are some studies with Toxoplasma gondii, the um, parasite that I talked about that gets into cats and rodents. Um, there's some speculation that that might be useful for dealing with some of these dopamine related disorders like schizophrenia that we talked about. Um, but again, that's all like very preliminary work as far as I know. So great question though. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So if you wanted this, this therapy, mm -hmm. but it's not FDA approved, where would you go? Oh, that's a good question. I don't personally know any of the researchers who are doing work on it, but there have been some studies published on it. So I would say you would want to probably start with Google Scholar and just see who's been doing this work. And usually the um, authors of those papers are gonna have their contact information. So I'd reach out to that author and say like, hey, where can I get more information about how to get a hold of these kinds of things? But so. I have no idea where you'd go. So I, I would say if you would probably want to talk to those authors because they would know who to connect you with to be able to get um, that kind of treatment. And I don't know if there's, I mean, at this point, I'm not sure if there are any physicians who are doing that because um, they're not an easy thing to get a hold of, but I don't know. I wish I had a better answer for you. Sorry. <laughs> there are ways. I just don't know what they are. <laughs> well, I mean, if I had them like hanging out in my basement, I would gladly give you my hookworms, but uh, the, the only way to grow those are to take them from somebody's species who's been infected and, and kind of perpetuate the life cycle of the parasite. Um, so the things like hookworms tend to, well, after they come out in the feces, the eggs hatch and the little larvae like hang out in the soil for a while before they come and in, become infective. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's any like labs that are purposefully cultivating them to like uh, make commercially available, but uh, they should because there's been some pretty strong evidence to suggest that they're helpful. Yeah, oh, I would say so, probably. I, I'm not saying that the authors would give you a treatment, but they might be able to tell you who you could contact to, to move forward with that. But. Yeah, that would be pretty unethical if you're not a physician to be able to prescribe that kind of thing. Yes. That is a great question and it's really variable. So it depends on the organism. So um, I don't know if everybody could hear the question, but the question was whether or not um, parasites that can change host behavior have a specific enzyme or other mechanism for being able to change that behavior in their host. Um, and the answer is it really just depends on the parasite. So there are some parasites that are gonna rely on specific molecules to be able to change the behavior of the host. Um, things like Toxoplasma gondii are gonna go to a different part of the host's body to be able to manipulate those changes, um, like in the brain of a rodent, for example. Things like the little nematode that we talked about inside the ant's abdomen, um, those are going to cause inflammation within the abdomen and help to change that, that color of the abdomen to a red color. So um, there's a lot of different mechanisms and that is a huge area of study for looking at what are those specific mechanisms and specific host parasite relationships. So, yeah, yes. So what was the reason for the 1863 import of the leeches? Um, so they had been using them for different types of bloodletting, different medical procedures at that point in time. And um, there were people who were pulling in local leeches, but the local leech populations had kind of been uh, destroyed because they had been using them so much. And so they started importing leeches in the early 1800s for those British hospitals. Um, and it just happened to be that that year, the report was over 7 million of these uh, leeches were imported. I don't know, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure what else was happening in 1863 in that part of the world. I feel bad because I double majored in history and I feel like I should know what was happening there, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, it would make sense if there was something else going on, but I don't really know. The largest, like physically largest? 
Oh man. Um, I'm not sure what the largest is, but the first one that pops into my head is probably Ascaris lumbricoides. The females can get to be about that long um, and they can produce like 200,000 eggs per day, which is pretty crazy. And these things live inside your intestine. Um, so if you get too many of the parasites, uh, they can actually like cause rips in your intestine and stuff, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, but they, that's probably the biggest one I can think of. In biology classes, when, you're, when students are studying nematodes, these little worms, um, in that, that big group of very diverse organisms, they often will use Ascaris lumbricoides to do the dissections because they are so large and because it's easy to see the anatomy. Um, but their eggs have a, a surface coating that is really resistant to things like stomach acid to be able to get into the intestines. Um, and the, the surface coating makes them really, really resilient. So they can actually survive being dipped in formalin. And you have to be really careful when you do the dissections because these things are usually preserved in formalin and sometimes the eggs are still viable. So, uh, you know, that's a fun thing to tell undergrads as you're, <laughs> you're going through a dissection. But everybody is really good with sterile technique that day, uh, which is good. So, any other questions? Yes. We're going to go with you. Um, are you familiar with uh, chronic wasting disease and doctors? Yes. Characterize the prion situation? That is a really good question. So there, there's a big debate about this because they do have sort of those characteristic things about parasites, but because it's a misfolded protein as opposed to an actual organism, it just depends on who you talk to. So there are parasitologists who study those diseases and look at the, the kind of patterns of what happens with these prions and how the disease is pe perpetuated and still call themselves parasitologists. Um, but classically, they wouldn't be considered parasites because they aren't actual organisms. So I think that's probably all, I, I don't know a whole lot about those, but um, hope that answered your question. Yeah, we don't really have an answer. So I guess that's the best I can answer your question. Did you have a question? Yes, I a question about the field definition as well. This is a student in parasitology. Essentially covers a really wide variety of organisms, you know, Venn diagram with the center of the circle that all have to intersect that parasites. Right. Uh, and so it, what, it seems like there'd be some challenges there as far as field definition. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can have you and another parasitologist in a room, but can you say completely different organisms? Um, and so I was wondering if you could just address that as well, all the potential challenges of parasitology as a field, just because it might be kind of interactions, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's a good point. So parasitology is this really broad field, and we do have, uh, when you go to a parasite conference, it's great because everybody is working on something different, right? So the challenge is that it is hard to kind of get everybody on the same page or to make sure that your colleagues have enough knowledge base to really be able to help you improve your science and make sure that you're, you're uh, being held accountable for different types of methods and, and all of these different things. But the cool thing about parasitology is that because it is so diverse and so variable, there's a lot of overlap for um, collaborative efforts. And there's a lot of that like transdisciplinary work. So you get people from all different walks of life who are things that are like, I study parasites, but I'm a biochemist, or I study parasites, but I'm really an MD, or I study parasites, but you know, there's always sort of that qualifier of like, I study this area of parasitology. Um, so it is kind of a hard thing to define. And um, the parasite community itself is pretty small for a lot of these different uh, conferences, especially the smaller regional conferences. Um, but you know, the national conferences hold their own in terms of numbers when we're not in the middle of a pandemic and can all meet together. Um, but it, it's really fascinating going and meeting other parasitologists because almost everybody has a different story or a different uh, career pathway for how they got to where they are and what they're studying. Um, and that's something that's kind of a neat story for science in a broader context because it's not something that silos people. It's something that actually brings different scientists from different walks of life together to be able to study all of these different areas. Um, a parasitologist can't just be a parasitologist. They have to be, you know, someone who studies the host. They have to be someone who studies the parasite itself. So they've got to know biology. They've got to know ecology. They've got to know a little bit about statistics and how those um, populational patterns are, are things that they're looking at. 
Um, many of them are people who study molecular things or genetic things or look at these relationships for categorizing all of these different parasites or somebody, you know, may come in and have a medical perspective of how do we treat or prevent or assess the risks for these different parasites. Um, so it makes these, these meetings really exciting because the talks are always different and you're always going to be able to, um, you know, try to lend your expertise, but also understand your own limitations and the importance of working with other people. Does that kind of answer? It does. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? One more? Yeah. 50 years ago, there was a uh, public health concern about eating undercooked pork. Mm -hmm. So what was it in trichinosis and what was it and mm -hmm. why did we not hear about it today? Oh, that's a good question. So I don't know if I can tell you too much about the history about it. <laughs> Again, don't tell people I got a second degree in, or a second major in history. I'll be in trouble. Um, but trichinosis is a type of little worm. And it's a worm that um, when, it in, uh, when you eat undercooked meat like pork, um, you can get it from eating bear meat, interestingly enough, and a couple of other things. The parasites actually go through this migration inside of the body as larval stages, and then they wind up embedding themselves in the muscle tissue. And they, they're these really cool little parasites that actually form this little um, encapsulation that they call a nurse cell, and it forces the host body to start like producing more um, blood vessels. So we start to see it kind of getting integrated into things and you get muscle aches and you get all of these pains and these parasites just sort of hang out in your muscle tissue. Now, normally when the parasite um, gets into something that's not a human, it does this so that the next host organism would eat the muscle tissue and then perpetuate the life cycle of the parasite. Um, but we know that if we, sorry, if we cook things like pork um, a little bit more thoroughly, it kills off the, the little nurse cells that are inside of the pork tissue. Because when you're eating pork, you're eating muscle tissue. So um, with uh, a lot of these ad campaigns for trying to do a better job of making sure that your meat is properly cooked, um, you can also get a number of different types of tapeworms from undercooked pork, um, also undercooked beef. So, I mean, I know there was kind of a public awareness campaign for trying to get people to make sure that their, their stuff's at the right temperature. There was some legislation that came out. Um, I don't remember if it was all at the federal level or if it was at a state level for different states. I can't remember exactly where all of that goes. Um, but some uh, food preparation legislation for like restaurants and things of like you have to cook the meat up to a specific temperature. And some of that was in relation to things like trichinosis or tapeworms or some of these other kinds of uh, parasites, as well as things like salmonella and other types of bacteria. Um, why we don't hear about it as much anymore, maybe because of that, I think, but I don't know for sure. Um, I know trichinosis is something that still happens. Um, it's just not very common. Um, so I would probably say that, I don't know for sure, but I would speculate probably just something to do with the FDA um, being a little better with the regulation on, on those kinds of materials. Does that answer your question? Okay. Felt like I rambled a little bit. Sorry, I got really excited when you said trichinosis and I started thinking about nurse cells and it's just so exciting. It's good stuff. Any other questions? All right, well, thank y'all for coming out tonight. Thank you for tuning in, those of you who are um, here with us virtually and hope you go out and learn more about parasites from this talk and think about zombies and vampires and uh, mummies in a whole new context. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jonica. Uh, one quick thing, I uh, just wanted to remind everybody that Steam Cafe happens every third Tuesday of the month at six. And next month, uh, we are having a talk from Dr. Darren Claybo, who is our South Dakota State Meteorologist and a research scientist at South Dakota Mines. He is going to talk about incident meteorology uh, weather prediction in wildfire management. And if you've been paying any attention to the national news, you will know that there are lots and lots of wildfires, really big ones in many states. It's been a very busy fire season. So that's going to be an interesting talk. Um, if anybody's hungry, the Steam Club is still selling slices of pizza. If you want to grab a slice before you leave. Um, as Jonica said, thank you for coming. Have a good evening.